find out what's making you sick and how to heal. Anthony William is the medical medium. Hello, I'm Anthony William, and you're listening to the Medical Medium Radio Show, where each week I talk about the most advanced healing information and secrets about health, much of which is not found anywhere else and is decades ahead of what's out there now. And much of the information that we share in these shows is more than decades. Some of the information is 100 years away from where we are now, where they're going to discover um, ahead of time, a hundred years ahead of time. Some is even more information in the books, the thyroid healing uh, book in the information in there could take 200 years if they go in the right direction someday out there to want to really care about stopping chronic illness. I believe, I believe the powers that be in the industries do not want people better. They want people sicker. I'm not talking about the doctors. I'm not talking about the doctors. The doctors want people better. That's why they go into it. That's why they go into it. That's why they're in it. They're in it to win it. They're in it to get people better. <laughs> they were. They have something in them that said, hey, I want to become a doctor. Something in them, in them that said, hey, I'm going to go through medical school and and stand in front of a cadaver, a person laying there, you know, and filled with formaldehyde. You know, and the, there's something in them, you know, <laughs> something in them said, hey, I want to help people. There's no question. But the powers that be above the doctor, above the doctor, well, they don't want people better. They don't. They don't want people better. It's not interesting. It's not, it doesn't interest them. Because if people get better, where does the industry go? It loses money. Guess how much? Trillions of dollars. Trillions of dollars. Come on. You, do you know how many grandfathered laws and investments and money and vaults with documents in it that exist, that run the industries that just no one has a clue? It's just we're just little tiny, we're two little tiny peasants, little pawns and peasants down here. We're not supposed to know about anything going on up there. Trust me. We're not. We just, oh, we get sick? Oh, what is it? Oh, wait, what is it? We got, it's genetic? Oh, I got autoimmune because it's genetic? Okay, well, I guess I'm just faulty and bad. No, there's, it's unbelievable about the, just, the, the corruption is just, you can't even imagine. So they want us sick, not the doctors. So the whole point is we're talking about, <laughs> we're talking about advanced information ahead of what's out there now. Spirit told me when I was younger, Spirit said, you know, you're getting, this is advanced information. I said, what's advanced? What does that mean? I didn't even know what the word meant. Spirit said, well, this is information that nobody knows that are not going to learn in a long time. And it, it was really confusing to me when I heard that when I was five, six, seven years old, eight years old. It was just baffling, baffled me. But I got used to it and understood it and understood it and just start seeing it, how it was happening and unfolding as each year went on, each decade that I've been alive and doing this and and everything else, and have watched it unfold, and the information is still ahead of out there what's now. It's in the books, the books that we write, Spirit and I write. I say we write because it's not, the information in the books is not cited from bogus, just garbage, recycled, non-helping theories and junk science and junk medicine. It's actually information that's not any of that. It comes from Spirit. And you know what? When you're sick, you know, that may not sound like interesting. That may not sound attractive to someone who's not sick because they're like, why would I want to go and do that? Why would I want to read his book? Why would I want to do that? Why would I want to know the answers and the truth to chronic illness? Why would I, why would I want to know that? I could just go to the doctor if I got a sniffle. But you get sick and you need help and you ain't getting the answers and you've been doctor to doctor and spent $10,000, $20,000, $50,000, $100,000, 100 doctors. You go through all that. And meanwhile, there's an answer from a real source that has it, a real source that's uncorrupted and not dirtied up because the information on this show is not repackaged or recycled theory information. It's the only show where the information here doesn't come from medical interest groups, medical funding with strings attached, botched research. Yeah, you, if you only knew medical lobbyists, internal kickbacks, money just – under the table being passed by hands, interest groups, investors going into persuaded belief systems, private panel of influencers, health field payoffs, or trendy traps. You know something? I know this is an annoying part of the show. We're talking about prostate today. We're talking about the prostate today, by the way. 
I know this is an annoying part when I ha- when I when I when I talk about that at the beginning of the show, but I saw on social media, I saw a couple of people say on social media say, you got to listen to the beginning of the show when he says that. You need to know how important that really is. I saw that on social media. Someone said you need to know how important what he's saying really is and what that means. You have to know what that means. It's that serious and that profound and that amazing that he's saying what he's saying. Because of what it really is. So I'm sorry I put you guys through this. Believe me. So none of that is in, none of that contamination is in any of the information here on this show on any any level. The information on this show comes from a pure, untampered, uncontaminated source, clean source, a source that helps you get better so you can see through the fog, not be blinded by the madness that's out there in chronic illness in medicine, in books and studies, on the internet. It is insane. It is insane where it's at today. And, and and the whole point is to be free from that. So yeah, when I was a child and Spirit was saying, well, this is advanced information. It's well, what's advanced? Didn't know what it was. I was just hearing the information from Spirit directly and giving it to people saying, oh, you, you have this specific, specific virus inside your liver. That's what's causing this. Oh no, you have this. This is what's going on. Um, you have a polyp in your sinus. A polyp in your science that hasn't been that hasn't been you know seen by the doctor yet, and that's why you're suffering. And they go to the doctor and they look over and over again. They look over and over again. And they finally find it, and the person says, "Oh my God, how can you know at nine years old I had a polyp in my sinus? How had a sinus cavity? How is that even possible?" And it was like that every all the time, and and it wasn't even just that. How did the polyp get into the sinus? No one could ever know. But the advanced information spirit gave me, you know, so I can tell the person. It got in there because that polyp started – that polyp actually has a bacteria that's sitting in the center of it, sitting in the center of it, thriving, a bacteria that's sitting in the center of it, and it's creating scar tissue. And the body's actually you know, developing a little capsule around that pathogen. Hearing that it from a nine-year-old when your doctor doesn't even know anything and couldn't even find the polyp to begin with. You know, people were blown away, and they still are today, and they still are at this point. They're blown away when they read the books. You just gotta, you just gotta know that the gift I was given was given to you, and not to me. It's so you can have the answers and see through the fog and help people, and help yourself, and I, and protect yourself. And that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. So we're talking about prostate. Um, you know, you know, it's funny is because um, prostate's it, it, it's an important part of life for men, important part of life for women, because if your husband is dealing with a prostate problem, you know, life is no fun in the sense that, you know, you could, you know, he's going to have, he can't pee, he's urination problems, he's up all night, he's getting up, you know, it's, it's not easy on a couple, it's not easy on a, on, you know, a family or a relationship or whatever, when one person has to get up and pee all night long and can't sleep good. Because of an enlarged, enlarged, you know, enlarged prostate gland, so the, these things are important. So prostate is important. Plus, there's prostate cancer. Plus, there's all that. So let's just let's go into it right away. Let's talk about it a little bit. Let's talk about the PSA, prostate uh, specific antigen. Let's talk about the PSA. What is the PSA? What does it mean? What's going on? It's an inflammatory test. It's for kind of like the ANA C reactive protein test. The Lyme disease tests are actually inflammatory tests. You you don't know this. But the Lyme labs aren't looking for bacteria. They put a name of a bacteria next to an inflammatory test. They pick and choose the name of a bacteria to place in, in next to the test. That's how it's done at the blood labs. That's how it's done at the blood labs, whether anybody likes it or not. I know people in the blood labs. I know people in the best blood labs there are, the best ones for Lyme and other things. And what it is is... What the what the Lyme test is that's today the best best blood test that your doctor sends out to the best lab the best most advanced lab there is right now. What that is is they don't look for bacteria. They put a bacterial name next to your level of inflammation. Why do you think when you're getting a Lyme test? <clears throat> why do you think they're borderline? Many of them are. You either have the bacteria or you don't. The best Lyme labs are like you're borderline. You either have the bacteria or you don't. There's no borderline. What they mean by that, and this was a mistake by the labs because they let out their secret this way, which really is – they don't do this as much anymore because they knew it was wrong. It was because it was it was 
showing the people what they were really up to, which was really bad news. By saying it's borderline means that there's inflammation. The test itself is an inflammation variety test. And they're seeing a little bit of inflammation, but not enough to say, okay, let's put a bacteria next to the the inflammation. They're not looking for bacteria. I'm sorry. So if you, you, but, but, you know, it's easy. I mean, the doctors don't even know what the blood labs do when with Lyme disease. I'm talking about Lyme disease because it's important because once you know how the Lyme test really works, then you'll know how the PSA really works. Then you'll know how the C-reactive protein works. You know how the ANA, anti-nuclear antigen test, you know how these, these work. And it's important to know how they work in order to understand prostate or anything else in the body. So I'll use Lyme disease as an example. If you're getting pissed off because you're somebody with Lyme disease and you're listening to the show for the first time, you're like, oh my God, this guy, this guy doesn't even know about bacteria, doesn't even know about Lyme bacteria, doesn't know about the best Lyme test, the best Lyme experts, doesn't know about all the YouTubes out there with the best Lyme doctors, doesn't know about all this. Yeah, I do know all about this and sorry, but they're all wrong. They're all wrong. I'm, I, I apologized. I got to apologize for them being wrong. Here's how it works. And and I know people in the best labs. What happens is they do they do an inflammation test. That's what it is. To see how much inflammation is in the body of someone suffering from neurological Lyme or neurological problems or whatever it is, because there's going to be inflammation everywhere in the body. Because when you're dealing with anything that creates Lyme disease or anything that creates anything else, anything that remotely gives you symptoms that are mysterious or neurological or or just any kind of sickness, inflammation, viruses, and bacteria do rise up inflammation in the body. But bacteria doesn't cause neurological problems. It's viral that causes neurological problems. So neurological Lyme is viral. Neurological, all that's viral. Um, You know, all of it is. RA, rheumatoid arthritis, is viral. Multiple sclerosis is viral. All that's viral. Um... Chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, chronic fatigue syndrome itself, all that is viral. So that's how it works. So what happens is, and you get a Lyme test, the Lyme lab, the, the doctor doesn't know that they're not searching for bacteria. The doctor doesn't know that. Some doctors are learning now, and they're learning that the Lyme lab is not looking for bacteria. They're looking for inflammation. Then they choose what bug they want to put into the level of inflammation you have. They choose. They actually choose for you. That's how it works. <laughs> they choose for you. And so they'll put, you know, Borrelia next to it. They'll put Babesia next to it. They'll put something next to it. And that's how they do it. And then they send that back to the doctor and the doctor will be like, well, you got Lyme. Oh, they'll say borderline. Borderline was the greatest mistake they could ever do because that's how they got, that's how they're found out that they do this. It's terrible. Borderline. No, you either have it or you don't. There's no such thing as borderline. You either have it. If you're looking for bacteria, it's bacteria you find you found. There's no borderline. And they're retracting that now because it was like, oop, that was a mistake. That was a big mistake. That was a big mistake. Because it 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 showed that they were running just inf- uh, inflammatory tests. And I know a couple of um lab technicians at two of the best, 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 best labs that are out there for Lyme. And you don't want to know. You don't want to know. Anyway, so the whole point is with the PSA, it's an inflammatory test. It's an inflammatory marker. Looking for a specific antigen. But here's the irony. You you can have an elevated PSA, but have another problem in the body and not even a prostate problem at all. You can have an elevated PSA and have a liver issue. How's that possible? Isn't it a specific antigen that the prostate produces? <clears throat> so the test is for the prostate producing a specific antigen. But you can have no prostate problem on any level, no enlargement, no inflammation, and still get a elevated PSA because of your liver. Because these tests are valuable. They are inconsistent. They aren't accurate. Never were, never will be, including the Lyme test, including the PSA tests, including the the RA tests, including all of them can never be accurate. They can't. It's not possible. We can only kind of guess. There's no, like solid confirmation that science and research has locked any of this stuff down on any level 
If it wasn't for me putting out information saying Epstein-Barr is the cause of prostate cancer, it wouldn't be out there now. The information is getting out there about Epstein-Barr causing prostate cancer. It's actually getting out there now. It's That came from me. That came from me. And so what happens is that they don't know. They don't know anything about the prostate, really. And they don't know anything about the test, too. They're just, the tests are really not great, concrete, accurate evidence. Scientific evidence, scientific. Got it all down. Sure, that's why 250 million Americans alone are sick and not getting help. Sure, sure, science research has it all sewed up. Yeah, believe that one. Sure. Hey, if you're not sick and you feel great and you're exercising and you lose a couple of pounds and you're eating, you know, a fancy trendy diet and you're young and you got you're indestructible and hey, life's good. You you'll think science has it all down. But don't be a sucker. Don't be a sucker. You know, the thing is, it's a see it to believe it society. I'm sorry. You either gotta see it or experience it. it that's what it is. Experience it to believe it. You got to get sick to believe it. You got to get sick to know science and research doesn't even know anything about chronic illness. You got to be sick to believe. You got to experience it to actually believe it. it. Because if you don't experience it, you'll never believe it. That's how we will live here. That's how we work. That's how we think. That's how we act. That's just the way we are here. So sad. It's so, so, so sad to even live like that. That's not good. It's not good. It's how we get tricked. It's how we get thrown down the wrong direction. It's how we don't help others. That's how we don't, you know, move the needle in the world of chronic illness. That's because of all of that. So it, it it's really sad. So the whole thing with the PSA test, you can have a liver condition. You can have a problem somewhere else in the body, somewhere happening. You can have inflamed nerves. You can have something else going on. You can have an oversaturated saturation of toxins and dirty blood, thick, dirty blood, and have these toxins floating around in your bloodstream. You could be on this not-so-great diet, really high-fat diet. You got toxic liver, toxic blood, everything else, and you'll trigger off a high PSA test. That's why even the industry says they can't trust the PSA test. They can't trust it. It's not a guarantee to decide if you have cancer or an enlargement prostate either. There's no guarantee with that. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If it's a prostate-specific antigen you have found, if you really found an antigen in the blood work, so the blood lab says he's got this specific antigen that the prostate produces, where can it go wrong? Where can, where can it go fallible? Where can it actually be a problem? How can it be a problem if it's a specific antigen they have found? Because something's wrong. Because it's not a specific antigen they're finding. If you can't guarantee it, if you can't guarantee that antigen is telling you anything, then something's wrong with the test itself. Something's wrong with the test itself. That's the whole point. That test can still get triggered off no matter what's happening in the body, no matter prostate or no prostate. Wait a minute, doesn't the prostate produce the antigen? It should because that's what it's picking up. So high, high, high levels of this antigen mean there's a prostate problem. There's people out there, prostate is perfect, perfect. And the antigen is through the roof. The antigen is through the roof. The reason why is because it's being triggered by the liver or triggered by something else. It's a test that's weak and just shows how science is and where science is. Basically, you just got to drop your pants. Doctor has to put a rubber glove on, stick his finger up there, try to press down on the prostate, try to see if he feels anything weird. Could try to do a, you know an MRI and CAT scan with contrast. You can try to do other things to see if you can pick up anything. And then you can kind of gauge symptoms. Are you frequently urinating in the night? What's going on? Are you, you know, disrupted? Are you, you know, urinating? What's happening? And stick your finger in there and... See if you can feel anything on the prostate. And that's that's kind of like the best it gets on top of the test. But there are a lot of enlarged prostates and there's a lot of prostate cancer. What's all that from? That's all from Epstein-Barr. You could have an enlarged prostate from Epstein-Barr and not be cancerous at all. And you can have cancer inside the pro- prostate from one variety of Epstein-Barr. There's a variety of Epstein-Barr. There's one out of the many 60 varieties that I talk about that I've actually written about that Spirit has given me the information about that nobody knows out there. 
nobody knows out there. And there's, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's one variety of the 60 varieties that's specific for prostate cancer. It gets into the prostate and it does that for men. That's true. And what happens is that there's also, you know, there's also inflammation that can occur with no cancer occurring in the prostate. Absolutely. And an enlargement. So we're going to cover that, what to do, how to do it, what, what happens, what's going on there. What's the best, you know, things you can do to protect yourself to stop uh, prostate problems from happening. If you want to just be pre- prevented for preventative because you think there's a prostate problem going on, you might be in your 40s. Women out there, maybe your husband's going in their 40s or 50s or whatever it is, 60s. And we just do the best we can and try to keep our husband safe and healthy and not getting a prostate problem. There's a lot of different things we can, we can explore to figure this out and cover. So that's what we're going to do. So how does it work? What happens is the Epstein-Barr gets into the liver first. That's where it gets into the liver. So it gets into everybody's liver and it starts out there. You can read my books to learn more about it. But what it does is for men, it goes into the prostate. It heads to the prostate gland. And it heads to the prostate gland. It nestles in there. It, it moves in there. It becomes part of the prostate gland. It drills in there, actually. It almost every man on the planet is going to have Epstein-Barr going into the prostate, whether it turns into something, whether it actually becomes inflammation, whether it actually becomes a problem, whether it becomes anything, that's that's all to be determined. A lot of different reasons why, how how a man is taking care of himself, what he's doing for himself, what he's, what he's eating. So we're going to cover foods and everything else there too. We're going to cover supplements as well with, with, with prostate. Um, So as Epstein-Barr moves into the prostate to find a home, it can sit in there for years. It usually gets in there in men in in their 20s. That's when it enters in, somewhere around in their early 20s. And so that's how it works. As Epstein-Barr not entered into a a man's prostate at, at that time, yeah, it could be delayed. It could be in the 30s. But almost every man on the planet will have Epstein-Barr enter into the prostate, whether it turns into something's another story, depending on all the different factors, how you're eating, what you're doing to take care of yourself, what your lifestyle's like, everything else under the sun, all that matters. But guess what doesn't matter? Guess what isn't involved whatsoever? Genes. That's not involved whatsoever. Genes. Not involved whatsoever. Blue genes might be involved a little bit sometimes if they're too tight in the crotch. So blue jeans, <laughs> if, they're, if you wear them too tight in the garage, if a man does for too many, too many, too many years, that's not going to help. But, but jeans themselves, hereditary, everything else, no, it has nothing to do with prostate cancer, prostate problems, or anything else like that. And so that's, that's another reason why even in the prostate world, something that should be nuts and bolts and cut plain and simple, like cut in plain cloth, like cut just, you know, just – Cookie cut, just perfect and plain and simple and packaged and bowed up and all ready and just ready for Christmas present, ready for a birthday present. It should be like prostate should be all sewed up. It should be all sewed up, but it's not. It is to say it's genetic. It's nothing sewed up in chronic illness. Nothing. Nothing. It's just that it blows my mind. I don't know if you know that emoji where the, the, the head explodes. You know, like it's a little smiley face. I don't, it's not a smiley face, but it's like a, the little face with the head just explodes. I mean, seriously. It's what it's like when you think about how not even prostate is, is sewed up by medical research and science on any level. So the virus tends to head to the, well, it does head to the prostate gland. It goes from the liver to the prostate gland. That's what it does. Sits in there and incubates, incubates, incubates. Doesn't cause much trouble until things kind of, the immune system drops, lymph, lymphocytes drop. There's not enough immune system around the prostate, um, around the uh, lymphatic system, all in the all in the groin area, all that. The lymphatic system in the groin area, all that protects your prostate. It protects your immune system, your whole lower immune system down there. Um, there's a theory out there. Um, well, I'll cover that a little later about the theory. It's it's kind of interesting. And kind of funny at the same time. But okay, so let's let's move into prostate, what, what can do. Well, a lot of people out there listening in this audience probably have husbands or men that are listening to this probably have prostate cancer. So they're just interested in the show because they have prostate cancer. Um, so we're going to have to talk about that. 
And, you know, there's a lot of I – mean, what you decide with your doctor and what you want to do is what you and your doctor are going to decide to do about how you're going to deal with your prostate cancer and about what what stage your prostate cancer is in. Um, I've always said this, and I've said this long before it became popular, long before it became popular. Years and years ago, I've always said this. Men that are of a certain age, which you know it's common. This is like common law right now in law of medicine. Men at a certain age – they can leave their prostate alone and not do anything about it if they have an enlarged prostate or they have prostate cancer. So they have a very early stage of prostate cancer and say they're 70 years old. So that's, you know, they have an early stage of prostate cancer. A lot of medical doctors are just leaving it alone, just monitoring, watching it. And that's getting popular now. That was where I stood long before that even became anything. So when people were coming to me 25 years ago and whatever, and men were coming to me and they're asking about their early stage prostate cancer, first of all, they would be asking if they had prostate cancer. So that would be, you know, spirit would know if they do or not. But whether they diagnosed with it or not, they they were worried about their early stage prostate cancer. And they were 70 years old or 75 years old or 69 years old. It was it was much better doing the right things for it, changing the diet, completely overhauling the diet, completely doing this, any supplements that were available 25 years ago. There weren't a lot of supplements available. And that's the one thing about alternative medicine I absolutely love is that there's a lot of heroes in alternative medicine. I mean, all the doctors and practitioners are heroes to me anyway, in conventional and in, in um, alternative medicine. And um, but there's a lot of heroes in this in the nutraceutical department developing and creating new supplements and stuff like that, and that's always been a beautiful thing. So, getting on getting somebody on the right supplements 25 years ago, getting them on the right, getting them on the right foods, with a low grade cancer in the prostate, being at a certain age, and letting it go, meaning taking care of it and monitoring it the best you can with your doctor. With, you can you can even reverse it at that stage. A lot of cases of, of stage one cancer in the prostate where it was reversible or just stayed the same all the way until they're 90 and then you'd die of something else. You'd go and die of a heart attack or heart problem or something else or whatever, some kind of failure, and you would you would die then, but you wouldn't die of prostate cancer. And now I think a lot of doctors are making that common practice. Now they're looking at the, the man's age, they're looking at the man's lifestyle, the age, what they're doing for it, how, how severe the prostate cancer could be or not be, or what, what's going on. But not every doctor's doing that. It's just half and half. It's like 50-50. So you got 50, sorry, sorry, I distorted the mic there. You got 50-50, you got 50, um, you know, 50% of the doctors are, they're, they're now being cautious because it's actually sometimes life-threatening to be playing around the prostate with surgery and even biopsies, doing too many biopsies on the, th- on the, on the, the prostate. Sorry, even, even the, you know, it's, it's actually tricky and it's dangerous because when they do a biopsy on a prostate, they don't just poke it once. They poke it a minimum of 30 times. Some doctors will poke the, the prostate 60 times. So they'll stick a needle in it 60 times. I mean, it's like a done turkey after that. Oh, my God. You know, it's like a done turkey in the oven after that. So it's not a 30-time law or a 30-time poking law or poking rule. It's like some doctors will go 50 times. Some doctors will go 60 times. And then a lot of people after the prostate biopsy, they, they're, they're sick for months. A lot of men are sick for months. They're not just up and walking and feeling fine. There's some of those, but... They get sick. They end up going into the hospital. They get admitted in the hospital with fevers, and they pass out when they're walking, and the weirdest things happen from that. So it's it's kind of aggressive. So you don't want you don't want to go through a lot of that. And of course, when you're dealing with prostate cancer, then there's then you're you know you're poking it sixty times, and it's you, you know there's a good chance you can start opening up that Pandora's box. And, you know, start spreading some cells around. That's not good either. So you can do a whole bunch of supplements and take care of yourself to make sure that you get all, you know, you clean all that up. So any cells that might have been dispersed, you can work on, you know, fixing and healing with the right supplements and the right diet so nothing happens. And then that's something you can do, which is really important. So depending on your age and what level of cancer that's theoretically determined by the doctor you know, 50% of them, 
they leave men alone. The other 50 say, okay, we're going to do radical surgery. We're going to do radical radiation surgery. We're going to do whatever we got to do. We're going to do some chemo, whatever we got to do. So there's just, there's just kind of like, there's two baskets now. There's two, there's two baskets people are in. So, and that's kind of where it lies out there. Maybe you're, you've experienced some of that and you know what that's like. Um, so what about the people that enlarge prostate, cancer or no cancer, nobody really knows, whatever, it's it's enlarged. Um, you're living with it. Your doctor says, okay, get enlarged prostate. Let's watch it. Let's monitor your PSA. Let's see what we got going on. And then you, you got that happening. Well, let's talk about getting rid of that enlargement. We'll also talk about what we can do for cancer. And some of it's going to be for both. Some of it's going to be for both, for helping both situations out. Prostate cancer and just enlargement all on its own. And symptoms, prostate symptoms of, you know, that, that there's something going on. So we'll deal with all that. So what are we dealing with when we're trying to help the prostate? We're trying to get a virus out of the prostate. We're trying to get a virus to leave the prostate. We're trying to beat, and beat down, destroy, and break down a virus is what we're trying to do. And we're trying to heal the prostate itself from viral damage. That's why it gets enlarged. It gets enlarged because it's getting agitated by the virus, living its life and moving and grooving inside the prostate, producing more viral activity, proliferating inside the prostate. Why would it proliferate? Why would it grow? Why would the virus sit inside a prostate and develop more and more and more and grow more and more and more? Because it's getting food food it likes. See, every gland in the body, every organ, every cell needs food. So when you eat, something from that food gets into every gland. It gets into your thyroid. There's like thyroid healing book. I talk about the best foods for your thyroid. It's not a guess either like the other books. The other books, it's all about guessing what diet. They just put you on some autoimmune blah, blah diet and for your thyroid or whatever it is. Oh, God, it's unbelievable. It's like throwing darts at the side of a barn. But in thyroid healing, specifically, really what's for thyroid and everything else, information that's not contaminated. So you want to, like, look into that book if you can. But the point is, it's like your body, everything, your gland, every gland, that's what I'm talking about, every organ, every cell is drinking food, drinking food. That means your prostate needs to drink food. It needs to absorb and utilize and eat food. So that means if you're not eating good food and you're eating food that feeds viruses because viruses eat, would you believe where we are today that science and research and the best doctors and the best experts and the best book writers and the best internet people and the best whatever clinics don't even know that viruses eat? And when you hear they do, it's because of my campaign with 20 years of getting it out there, including the books now, and getting that information out there. And then you will hear eventually, oh, wait, we think, oh, it's a discovery. We think a virus eats, and that's going to be fantastic. That would be amazing if that happens. But I won't be getting any credit, I'm sure, of that. Thieves in the night don't give anybody credit. Here's the deal. So... Your prostate is drinking. It's eating. It has to. Every organ does. You eat a food that feeds the Epstein-Barr virus inside the prostate. It's going to grow. It's going to get the food it needs. It's going to get the food it wants. It's going to be hungry. It's going to be a hungry, hungry hippo. Hungry, hungry hippo is what it is. I don't know where I got that from. Hungry, hungry hippo. (laughs) Wasn't there something in the 70s as a hungry, hungry hippo thing? So, and... So that's what it would do. And the virus will feed off of it. So if you're eating if you're eating something like corn, corn's not good to eat because basically all corn on the, the planet is contaminated at this point. You guys know that. You don't need me giving you a GMO lesson. But you know, corn products, that's really more specific to feeding a prostate problem, kind of corn products, any kind of corn. Here's another thing, dairy, right? Any kind of dairy. Pork will feed Epstein-Barr. It's too much soy that can feed Epstein-Barr. Um, 
eggs. Eggs are the big one. Men eat a lot of eggs, right? I mean, you're a guy listening right now. You eat a lot of eggs. You probably do or have, or maybe you know your friend does for sure. But men eat eggs. Women eat a lot of eggs. (laughs) But men, I think men eat more eggs. I'm pretty sure men like their eggs. They like their eggs. They like them in different ways. So with the eggs is that it, the problem is with the eggs is that what's in the eggs goes to the prostate very easily. Prostate does absorb lots of different chemicals from eggs, pasture-raised, organic, free-range eggs. These are natural chemicals inside these eggs that absorb into the prostate and feed a virus, such as Epstein-Barr, which loves to feed off them. Decade after decade of egg sandwiches, egg omelets, egg dishes, fried eggs, diners, diner eggs, restaurant eggs, home cooked eggs, your wife making you eggs, your your, your sister making you eggs, whatever it is, your girlfriend making you eggs all through your life, they add up. And by the time you get to 40, 45, 50, 38 30, 32, your your prostate starts to enlarge. Slowly but surely, because the virus is getting everything it needs. And then if you're on a high-fat diet, because yes, you've been eating eggs and you're eating cheese and you're eating all these other things, and you're on this high-fat diet, you're going to you're eating burgers. You're on this high-fat diet. It's not the bun on the burger that's the problem. I know everybody thinks it's the bun. Now, the bun on the burger is a problem to some degree. It's the gluten. It's the thing that actually, you know, does feed viruses too. So sure, you have the gluten, which will feed viruses in a bun on a burger. But the burger itself is so high in fat that that allows the virus to also prosper because you're shutting out oxygen in your bloodstream. So you're, you're minimizing your oxygen levels in your bloodstream. You're lowering them by just barely. It's not even registrable on an oxygen level test that says you got 98% oxygen, you got 99% oxygen. Well, there's all these point, 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 zero, 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 ones, 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 in between them all. And it's not as clear cut as just 98%, 99%, 100% oxygen levels. It's not as clear cut as that. And when you're at die on a diet of high fat continuously for so many years and the high fat's breaking down the liver and the high fat is, is minimizing your oxygen levels little by little by little, your, your prostate doesn't get the oxygen it needs to keep a virus from growing. So it doesn't get the oxygen it needs to keep a virus from growing. So the virus just just thrives. And then the food you're feeding it, like, yeah, the bun, which is gluten, which will feed a virus, but most importantly, the eggs and everything else, the dairy and other things I talked about. And you're just doing that. And yeah, sure, barbecue, pork on, pork ribs on a barbecue, but your prostate's just going to be, it's one more set of barbecued ribs to your prostate cancer. It's so one more bringing you down the lane to prostate problems, to peeing all night long, having to pee all night long, and getting your spouse, partner, friend, whatever, just all upset. And, you know, discomfort and all kinds of problems occur. So we have to be careful on what we're eating. If I, if, if I had a prostate problem, I would go 100%, 100%, 100% plant-based is what I would do. If there's a prostate cancer problem, you go plant-based. Remember, this isn't a campaign against animal protein. People who know me and know my books and everything else, I don't sit on one side of the camp and I'm not involved with the food wars. I'm not involved with the vegans fighting the paleos, the paleos fighting the vegans. I'm not involved with that war. That's not my war. That's not my battle. My battle is giving you real answers to chronic illness for the first time in medical history. That's my battle and getting people to actually receive the information, getting the information to them. That's my battle. Making sure people take care of themselves, making sure people heal. That's my battle. 
But what, but but it is what it is. Truth is truth when it comes down to prostate cancer. You got prostate cancer, you got enlarged prostate. You want to go 100% vegan, plant-based. You can go 100% raw plant-based. You can go 100% plant-based cooked if you want. But you got to get off the animal products because the more animal products you eat, the thicker the blood gets and you'll never get the prostate cancer to back down or you'll never get the enlarged prostate to back down or you'll never protect yourself from prostate cancer if you're afraid of getting prostate cancer. So you want to go plant-based. Now, it's okay if you don't go plant-based. You can still minimize your animal proteins. Let's get rid of your dairy products. Let's get rid of your fish. Let's get rid of your eggs. Let's get rid of any milk, butter, cheese. No butter, no butter. Butter's disastrous for men. You know, I see it out there, and, and I, 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 I laugh, but I laugh in a sad way. I see it out there where you see some trend where butter is good. You know, like grass-fed butter is good. And it's like, it's supposed to be good for you. The people are afraid of critically clean carbohydrates. They're afraid of eating, they're afraid of eating sweet potatoes, afraid of eating all the fruit, afraid of, afraid of being poisoned in their mind about all that, fruit fear and everything else. And they end up eating sticks of butter as if it's going to make you stronger or healthier or better. It's disastrous. And I laugh about it because I'm like, okay, whatever. We're all human and you get sick in the end. Everybody gets sick in the end. Everybody gets sick in the end because if they don't do all the right things and all the things they need to do, they all get sick in the end. So what is it going to be? So these trends and these different things, it's just unbelievable what happens out there. So I'm saying you got to get the butter out of there. Can't have that. And if you want to have a little animal, animal protein because you're a guy and guys, they can't part with their animal protein and... And I understand, hey, women, they feel the same way. They can't, they can't part with their chicken. Chicken has to be everything. Chicken everywhere. It has to be chicken, chicken, chicken. Chicken salad, chicken fajitas, chicken this, chicken that. It has to be, you know, bre chicken breast, chicken. It just has to be chicken, chicken, chicken. I get that. But when you're dealing with the prostate cancer or enlarged prostate or fear of prostate problems, you got to keep that chicken down low. That, that's got to be down low. If you, if you can't relieve... If you can't release yourself from animal products, then just minimize it once a day, once every other day, once every three days. Get your prostate better. You know, lower the, that'll lower the fats. Bring in some avocado. Bring in some more avocado. Bring in some hemp seeds. Bring in some walnuts. Walnuts are a miracle, a miracle for prostate cancer. It's one of the foods on my food list. Walnuts. So if you're a guy, you should be eating walnuts. They're great for prostate cancer. Yeah, they're high in fat, but it's it's not the fats that actually that's actually doing anything to get rid of to help the prostate. It's phytochemicals, antioxidants, nutrients, other compounds that are in a walnut that aren't even studied or looked at by science that actually help get rid of get rid of prostate cancer, reduce it, get the prostate feeling better. Hemp seeds are good. Lots of fruits and vegetables, celery juice. Can't say celery juice enough because it's one of the best secret weapons to getting everything fixed. Celery juice is a miracle. People, it'll, celery juice will lower your PSA, your bogus PSA test. <laughs> you know, it'll actually lower it because it'll starve bacteria and viruses in the body. It'll lower your inflammation overall and your PSA will start getting better. Whether the PSA was really from your prostate or not, the readings. Because they don't know. They don't even know. So it's going to lower it. And that's what's great about the celery juice. So what do you need for prostate? Lots of antioxidants. You've heard about antioxidants. It's nothing new. Everybody's been talking about antioxidants for years. It's so not new. I mean, God, we've been talking about antioxidants for what, 20 years now? We've been talking about antioxidants. But what about all the undiscovered antioxidants that are all in fruits? Lots of different fruits. It's not just the wild blueberries. You want the wild blueberries. You want all the different berries. You want the apples. But you want every, every piece of fruit. Mangoes, papayas, apples, berries, cherries, plums, nectarines, peaches, um, kiwis, grapes. You want them all. And then you want your greens. Kale. You want kale with prostate problems. You want to eat kale every day. You want spinach. Spinach and kale salads. Spinach and kale salads. 
Lots of different lettuces. Butter leaf lettuce. That's a great one. Romaine lettuce. That's a great one. Celery sticks chopped up in your salads. Cucumbers. Tomatoes, tomatoes, tomatoes. Tomatoes alone are a secret weapon to stopping prostate cancer. They're a secret weapon to reversing prostate cancer. They're a secret weapon to reversing all enlarged prostate problems. Tomatoes, fresh tomatoes, fresh tomatoes chopped up in your salads every single day. Do not listen to that bogus, trendy garbage someone's trying to hang their hat. People are trying to hang their hat on with tomatoes as being bad for you. It can keep your husband from dealing with suffering, like endless suffering with prostate problems. That's what tomatoes can do. They can keep your husband from suffering from from endless prostate problems. So don't be afraid of tomatoes, heirloom tomatoes, chop them up, throw them in salads, the whole bit. And that's amazing for what we need for prostate. Supplements. Coenzyme Q10, that's a great one. Melatonin, you guys. Melatonin. 20 milligram capsules. I would do 20 milligram capsules. Take one capsule before bed at night. Take two capsules before bed at night. That brings down inflammation in a prostate. Why? Because melatonin is 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 a a, a weapon or an antagonist against Epstein Barr. Melatonin's a weapon against that Epstein Barr. It's a weapon. It's a great one for like men dealing with prostate Epstein Barr viral issues. So 20 milligram capsules take at night before bed, 40 milligram, cap, you know, you can do 40 milligrams. You can do 60 milligrams if you're dealing with a serious prostate problem before bed. So um, I like ALA, ALA alpha-lopaic acid for prostate problems. I like turmeric, curcumin, curcumin. That's amazing for prostate problems, curcumin, nettle leaf, large amounts of nettle leaf, like six, eight capsules every single day, 10 capsules every day of nettle leaf. Go to my directory, find the best stuff on my website. So you can do the, um, you can do the nettle leaf capsules. That's really good. A little bit of licorice root, a little bit of licorice root periodically. Incredible for prostate and large prostate, really helpful. L-lysine. Lots of L-lysine, vitamin C. Honestly, if you do a lot of vitamin C, like 6,000 milligrams a day, maybe six capsules twice a day of the 500 milligram capsules, talk to your doctor, talk to your practitioner. This is just what I would do for myself. It's what I would do. I would take a whole bunch of vitamin C. If I had a prostate issue developing, a whole bunch of vitamin C, take it twice a day, every single day. I would take the melatonin. I would take the zinc a good few dropper folds of the liquid zinc, the kind that I like. The B12 is important. That's a good one. A little bit of licorice. Lots and lots of nettle. I'd be doing curcumin plus turmeric. I'd be doing both, turmeric and curcumin. I'd be doing aloe vera. I'd get the aloe vera leaves. I'd cut a piece off of it, throw it in the smoothie, you know, scoop out the gel, leave the green skin out, throw the green skin out in the garbage. I put it in this blender, I blend it, blend it, blend it up, drink it. So that's what I would do there. I would have the aloe vera drink every single day. I would have the celery juice every single day, lots of fruits and vegetables. I would get off the animal proteins, totally just get off animal proteins. If I had a prostate problem, I bet you everybody's like, does he eat animal protein? Does he not? What does he eat? Does he eat? Does he not? What is he? Is he plant-based? Is he not? Someday I'll tell everybody what I am. <laughs> Someday I'll let everybody know what I do. I can tell you this, though. I do eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. I can tell you that. And a lot of herbs. A lot of herbs and fruits and vegetables, which leads to other herbs, too. You want to have all the herbs you can. You want to have lots of parsley to deal with prostate issues. Lots of parsley. Lots of cilantro. I would even consider the heavy metal, the medical medium heavy metal detox smoothie. While blueberries, the barley grass, the spirulina, I would definitely bring that in. The dulse, you know, all of it. I would bring that in 100% cilantro. Have that at smoothie with lots of fruit and the wild blueberries in there. I'd have that every single day. If somebody with prostate problems, with prostate gland issues, enlargement, um, cancer, you name it, because the toxic heavy metals do become food 
for the virus that creates enlarged prostate and the toxic heavy metals do get to the prostate and they enter the prostate. And then the virus eats the toxic heavy metals in the prostate. It gets another source of food. Go on the heavy metal detox smoothie. So these are some of the things I would do, without a doubt, all of those. Lots of parsley. I would take a whole head of parsley, chop it up, throw it on top of a salad. Put an avocado on there. It's okay. Throw some hemp seeds on there. That's okay. If you're eating animal proteins, lower it to once a day to once every other day so you make room for the other foods that heal the prostate because what's in these other foods, what's in parsley, cilantro, what's in all of these matters. Oregano, that's another one. You could do oregano oil capsules. And even omega-3 capsules, DHA, plant-based DHA, EPA, omega-3 capsules are good with prostate problems. But but oregano is a great one. Oregano oil capsules, I would chop up fresh oregano, throw it in your salad. These, I'm giving you as many options as, you know, really good. And then hydration, lemon water, ginger tea, lemon water, celery juice, cucumber juice. Pick the one you want. I would, I would bring in celery juice without a doubt. Bring them all in. Hydration, water, lemon water every day on and off all day long. A little bit of lemon water because you need to flush out the poison and get hydration and oxygen down to that area, especially if you're taking vitamin C. So the vitamin C will work even better down there. Lots and lots of tomatoes. Don't be afraid of tomatoes. You got prostate and large prostate or prostate problems. Bring in tomatoes. They are a hero for chronic illness. Don't get sucked into that nightshade theory. Don't whatever you do. It's unbelievable what's going on out there. Unbelievable. Tomatoes literally can keep you from, they can keep you from dying earlier in your life. They can give you a longer lasting life and they don't create inflammation. It was tomato sauce on a pizza for God's sake that triggered off the first bout of everybody thinking, well, it's got to be the tomato because obviously the cheese isn't going to give me arthritis. No, not the cheese. It's going to be the tomato that gives me arthritis. This is how the whole mistake was made to begin with. And then there's people that because they believe it's the tomato, they don't eat a tomato, they eat something else. And then two days later, they get arthritis from something they ate two days ago. Meanwhile, they had a tomato one time and they're like, it must have been the tomato. It's unbelievable. You just got to eat the tomato ripe and you got to pick the best varieties and you got to pick the sweeter varieties. It's even better. It's always even better and healthier for you. So do not forget that. Bilberry is actually really good for prostate too. Bilberry. Elderberry. It's another one. Elderberry syrup, bilberry, any kind of bilberry um, supplement is actually helpful for prostate. Think about that one. Resveratrol is helpful. I mean, if you want to go with some more supplements, but I would be doing a ton of wild blueberries for prostate. I'd be doing cranberry. You know, buy some buy some cranberries, frozen cranberries. If you want cherries, that's a great one for prostate issues. Cherries, so do the cherries. That's a great one. Bring them in. All the different fruits, like I said, tons of apples, whatever you can bring in. Applesauce is good for prostate. Even oatmeal is good for a prostate problem. Listen, if your guy has a hard time going, you know, lower on the bad foods, he can't get rid of his eggs, he can't knock down the red meat. Yeah, that's right. You think red meat's good for prostate cancer? No, it's not. I promise you it's not. Has nothing to do with anti-paleo, anti-this, anti-this, anti-vegan. It has nothing to do with that. I'm just saying you can't eat red meat with prostate problems. I'm sorry. I don't care where the cattle was raised. You just can't do it. So get your guy off of that. Put him on wild salmon. Put the guys on wild salmon. If you're a guy listening to this, go on wild salmon if you can't get rid of all your animal products. Do wild salmon every like twice a week, two, three times a week. As long as you're doing the heavy metal detox smoothie and you're doing everything else, you're pulling out heavy metals and you're doing everything else, you're doing good. If you got to be on wild salmon, do the wild salmon. So that's our show on prostate. I hope I gave you enough I hope I gave, guys gave you enough meaning like, you know, I think we covered what we needed to cover. Listen, I love you guys. Just know that I'm with you. Take one day at a time. We can take care of our prostates. We can do it. We can do what we need to do. And all right, keep a light heart one day at a time. Okay, God bless you. I love you guys. And I'll see you at the next show. Talk to you soon. And take care of yourself. Pat yourself on the back. Have some compassion for yourselves. I love you. Bye-bye.